Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for standing by, and welcome to the Best Practices for Application Virtualization webinar. During the presentation, all participants will be in a listen-only mode. Should you wish to ask a question during the presentation, please use the chat feature located in the lower left-hand corner of your screen. If you need to reach an operator at any time, please press star zero. As a reminder, this conference is being recorded. I would now like to turn the conference over to Timothy Davis, Product Marketing Manager. Please go ahead. Thank you very much. Good morning, good afternoon, good day. My name is Timothy Davis. I'm the Product Marketing Manager for Admin Studio here at Flexera Software. And I'm very excited today to have a, a speaker, uh, Stephen Thomas, with us from Microsoft. Uh, Stephen is a senior consultant at Microsoft specializing in end-to-end -end cloud mobility and virtualization solutions. He has over 20 years experience in the IT field working with Microsoft technologies. And he's worked with both the small mid-sized business market as well as large enterprises. He's considered one of the worldwide technical subject matter experts in AppV, uh, VDI, uh, user experience virtualization, and in addition, he's very highly skilled at uh, enterprise cloud and on-premise technologies including Azure and Microsoft System Center. Currently, Steve works as, uh, is working projects for Microsoft Enterprise Services in the overall specialty areas of client solutions and deployment with a focus on remote desktop services, virtual desktop infrastructure, MDOP technologies, uh, and leveraging on-premise Office 365 and Azure infrastructures. Uh, previously, Stephen worked as a Microsoft commercial technical support as an end-to-end -end virtualization specialist, working with all Microsoft virtualization products from desktop to data center. I'm very excited to have uh, Stephen here today with me. Uh, we've gotten a, a lot of registrations for this webinar. Uh, and this webinar is, is going to be more of a a technology deep dive uh, than we've done in the past. We've gotten some feedback that we would like, um, our audience would like a little bit more technical deep dives into areas uh, such as AppV. Uh, and today uh, we definitely will be able to deliver that. So Stephen, I'd like to uh, introduce you and welcome you to the webinar today. Thanks, Timothy. Uh, it's great to be here. I look forward to uh, talking about a lot of the advancements and evolution in our product over the last couple of years and where we're headed in the future as well. Great. So before we start out, you know, for, for newbies like myself, you know, let's, let's start at the very basics. What is AppV and uh, virtualization? Can you kind of explain that just for the, for the people that are non-technical on the phone maybe? Uh, certainly. AppV is short for Application Virtualization, and it's Microsoft's product that evolved from a product called SoftGrid, which uh, was originally developed by a company called Softricity several years back. And essentially what AppV does is it allows you to uh, convert the uh, package format of, of an installation of a, of a software application into an installed steady state that is self-contained and uh, optionally isolated as well. What winds up happening is you now have a portable, modernized packet that is available for flexible streaming options and at the same time is able to be um, isolated from other applications running on the top of an operating system. So it provides application to application um, isolation compatibility and can resolve a lot of issues. But more so in recent, uh, in recent years, we've seen AppV move more towards uh, a portable, simplified deployment mechanism, so much more than necessarily isolation. But that pretty much is in a nutshell what AppV is from a uh, kind of a 50,000 foot level. Okay, great. That, that, that helps, definitely. And uh, I am looking forward to hearing about some of the future directions for AppV that I know you're going to be talking about. So before we uh, get into the meat, there is a poll question. Uh, we have quite a few people dialed in uh, in our audience. And uh, to start off, we'd kind of like to get an idea of where you are uh, with AppV. So the poll question that you should see on your, on your screen is, which version of Microsoft AppV are you currently using? 
Uh, and you can select the option on the screen or, or enter your answer in the chat window in the lower left-hand corner. Uh, while we are waiting for people to vote or to make their selection, I wanted to remind you that if you do have any questions for myself or for Stephen, please use the chat window in the lower left-hand corner, uh, and we will be able to uh, try to get to as many of those as we can. So let's see, I'll take a couple more seconds. Lots of, lots of answers are coming in. So let's see. skip to the results. Okay, we have a, a half of the audience is currently not using AppV, so hopefully that means that they are great prospects for moving to AppV. Um, and then it looks like AppV 5.0. Um, probably is the, the, the most used version um, with AppV5.1 following right behind it. That kind of surprises me that uh, we have so many people that are on a current version. Uh, what do you make of this, Stephen? Well, I, I'm certainly not surprised. Um, I'm, 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 surpri I'm not surprised that there are a lot of people that are still on AppV4.6 um, because we drastically changed the product in AppV5. Uh, 5.0 has now had some significant time to bake. We're now through three significant service pack releases of v 5. And of course 5.1 has now been out for approximately eight or nine months. So this particular distribution of, uh, of, of version uses is not surprising to me at this point. Okay, great. So um, with that in mind, let's move on, and I will kind of pass it over to you uh, and, and let you go ahead. Certainly. So uh, as Tim said, my name is Steve Thomas, and I'm thrilled to be here today. I'm thrilled to talk about what uh, we're, we're talking about as best practices, but I also like to use the term current recommended practices. It's important that we understand that best practices can evolve as the product evolves and as we continue our various practices, so to speak. And what I wanted to focus on are the two most significant releases of AppV in terms of iteration, 5.0 SP3 and AppV 5.1, because that, uh, that evolution has brought a lot of flexibility into the AppV 5 product and has brought a lot of changes to the AppV, pro uh, AppV 5 product that will serve two purposes. It will enhance adoption, especially for our existing AppV 4.6 and 4.5 customers who have been reluctant to move to AppV 5. And of course, it has kind of made us change a little bit what our current recommended practices are as well. So um, let's start off with the changes that we introduced in AppV 5.0 SP3. So probably the most drastic change in 5.0 SP3 was that with connection group changes. If you're not familiar with what a connection group is, when we virtualize applications, we're virtualizing them into individual package, packages which are isolated from one another. So what we're able to do with connection groups is we're able to take multiple packages and combine them into a single virtual environment so applications can interact with other applications in, in its own kind of self-contained meta environment. For example, a good use case for this would be Microsoft Office or a master application that has a lot of plugins and add-ins to where you don't necessarily want to create one gigantic package uh, that has all the app the, the application add-ins and plugins because you might have different users targeted for different add-ins and plugins. And that's where connection groups allow us to uh, be flexible in our deployment of at the packages. And of course, uh, we changed something called merged, ro merged routes where we're now able to actually merge the uh, package root or the PVAD root of applications which has uh, given us a lot more flexibility as well. And we also made some changes with sequencing where we actually uh, hid the primary virtual application directory 
which is a method of sequencing similar to the old uh, mount method of sequencing from at v4.x, if those of you who are still on at v4.x are looking for an analogy to that. And then we also uh, switched the run virtual feature to where it no longer requires global or what we call uh, machine mode. It can now also run in user mode. Run virtual is the key, registry key where you can permanently designate a local application that's installed natively to automatically launch inside the virtual application bubble, so to speak, or virtual application environment of a specific uh, AppV package upon launch. A good example of this would be Internet Explorer. If you want an Internet Explorer to always run in a virtual environment, you can take advantage of the Run Virtual Key. Prior to SP3, the Run Virtual Key was a machine-wide deployment, which in a, in, in a sense kind of uh, limited it to uh, a, a, a limited scope of deployment. So this switching of the uh, Run Virtual to User Mode gives us quite a bit more flexibility. And as a result, allows us at Microsoft, especially those of us in enterprise services, to be able to adjust our current recommended practices. So let's focus a little bit more in detail. So as mentioned, a connection group is a way for us to take two applications that were completely separate in terms of sequencing. They were both sequenced using the AppV sequencer into two separate virtual application packages and combine them into, a, into the same virtual environment. Likewise, when you combine them into the same virtual environment, the virtual elements will converge. Particularly, your, fi your virtual file systems will converge into a larger space, and your virtual registries will converge as well. This gives us the uh, capability of uh, deploying a master application like Paint.net in this example to a wide subset of users, but at the same time we can limit the deployment of the add-ins, and this in the case of Paint.net plugins, to an even smaller subset of users. Now connection groups are similar to a feature we had in AppV 4.6 called Dynamic Suite Composition. Uh, the difference in connection groups in 5.x and Dynamic Suite Composition is Dynamic Suite Composition was an out-of-band feature that was not managed in scope in terms of the client's WMI interface. Likewise, it couldn't transcend into the architecture of AppV in terms of the AppV publishing infrastructure or if you're deploying packages through Config Manager. So when AppV 5 was, was actually released, we had the, the connection group feature, but the connection group feature was somewhat limited. The feature was limited to targeting must match the package distribution. So in, in, in the world of AppV, we have user-targeted applications and we have machine-targeted app, targeted applications, also known as globally published applications. Well, prior to AppV 5 Service Pack 3, if you had globally published packages, they required a globally enabled connection group. If you had user-targeted packages, they required a user-enabled connection group. And we could not mix the two. That has now changed. With connection groups, one thing I like to point out is the biggest pitfall I find in connection group usage in the AppV world is People tend to retrofit packages. For example, you have a package that, uh, let's say, hooks into an, a, a universal communication application. Let's say you have an email package and you're virtualizing it, and then you also have a unified communications package. And normally when those two are natively installed, they know about each other's presence. Well, the problem is sometimes when we're sequencing, we're sequencing on a clean machine. So each other's application doesn't necessarily know about the other application being resident, 
And so during the installation, they do not actually hook into each other properly. And um, usually we call that the attempt to retrofit uh, two disparate packages. So the most important thing in terms of the design and sequencing process is to know your application and know your application dependencies. Because even though these packages will be treated as separate packages and then later joined with a connection group, these virtual application packages still must know how to hook into each other. I'll give you a case in point. Let's say that you're installing uh, Skype for Business and you want to virtualize Skype for Business and you want to virtualize uh, Outlook. Well, if you are uh, virtualizing Outlook, um, Actually, that's probably a bad example because we, we now generate all that for you. So let's take it a step back. Let's say you, you're using legacy versions of Office. Let's say you have Office 2010 and you have Link 2010. And you wanted to sequence them separately and join them together, together in a connection group. Well, uh, in order for Outlook to know the presence of Link during sequencing, Link will need to be installed on the machine in advance. And likewise, if you're virtualizing Link and Link needs to plug into Outlook, Outlook needs to be installed on the machine at the same time. So know your application, know your dependencies, and then finally understand your, how your configuration files will actually override each other potentially. The problem when you're dealing with registry convergence and file convergence is the last writer wins. And in the world of connection groups, that's based upon the priority of each application package within the connection group. So it's important that uh, you have your configuration files properly engineered and designed to actually ensure that the configuration files that you want to win out will actually win out. And what I usually do, if I have a complex connection group that may have four or five or six applications or even more, what I will actually do is I will actually um, create a special package of nothing but configuration files. And I will put that as the highest priority package in the connection group listing of, pack of, of application packages. Now, so Steve, I, I, I have a couple questions here before we move off the um, connection group design. Certainly. So one of, the, one of the ones that came in were, are connection groups limited to V? FS sequences. In other words, a VFS sequence will not be able to connect into a P PVAD sequence. So uh, that, that question was asked by Mike Updike, and Mike could not have asked that question at a better time if I had paid him to ask that question. Uh, <laughs> so the, 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 the beauty of connection groups now in SP3 and later is, in a, prior to SP3, we only converged VFS paths. Uh, this merged root um, feature that I was mentioning earlier means that now PVAD directories merge as well, which means now that uh, we don't have to purposely sequence applications as VFS. And um, yes, mea culpa, uh, about a year ago I did post a blog discouraging use of the PVAD. I was wrong. Now, for those of you who follow my blog, this is a big deal for me to admit I was wrong about something. But it goes back to what I was talking about with current recommended practices. Practices change over time. And I used to recommend VFS sequences in the past because of the issue with connection groups and connection group convergence. However, the merge root has kind of made that point obsolete now. And the flexible connection group uh, model has been really helpful. But at the same time, it's also important to point out that there, we still have some applications which do require PVAD sequencing in order to function appropriately. Uh, one example is Microsoft Office 2010, which uh, is kind of significant because that's actually a Microsoft application. Um, but of course, um, there are several MVPs out there that are maintaining lists of applications that they have found that require PVAD. And that's what's great about the community, especially the MVP community and the AppV community, is when we learn this information, we share this information with each other. And that's why we're successful. 
Awesome. Um, one more question I'll throw out at this time is how clean do you usually have your capture machine? Do you typically capture on machines that have Office and other applications installed? So it, this, uh, this connection group design uh, slide could also be the same slide for just generic sequencing. Um, you should know your application but at the same time know your dependencies because your dependencies are going to need to be there, especially if they're not going to be packaged within the virtual application package. Now, some people ask me, um, do I have a domain join machine? Do I have a um, isolated machine? That's going to depend on the application. For example, in some cases, applications may require connection to a back end during installation. Uh, especially if it's the front end of a client server application. And in those cases, I will actually have the, um, the, the, the sequencing VM actually on the network and joined to the domain. Um, sometimes I'm sequencing a slew of applications that may have the same specific dependencies, so what I will do is I'll save a specific snapshot that has those dependencies pre-installed so I can constantly go back to that snapshot and not have to reinstall these dependencies over and over again. Um, the two things that I'm a stickler for that I do not, uh, I, I, I really never compromise on is uh, regardless of the security team that I'm working with, and this sometimes requires me to sequence in an isolated VM, but I disable antivirus while sequencing just for performance reasons primarily. And at the same time, if you've got something like Configuration Manager running or WSUS running, I actually keep those uh, stopped and suspended as well, especially Configuration Manager, because there's no telling what might accidentally get captured during sequencing. Um, yeah, we, we've got some more sequencing questions coming in, so I, I, let's, let's keep going. So should I use a domain joined computer to sequence applications is a question we're getting from Fred. Only if the application requires it, the application that you're sequencing requires it. And uh, the last one, and then I'll let you move on, is uh, is it better if you use connection groups to sequence them all to the same dummy installer directory? Uh, I'm not, oh, so if you have a connection group and you have multiple applications that they all have the, share the exact same, uh, inst are, you, are you talking about application install directory or the primary virtual application directory? I would, um, I would always have different PVADs for different applications. The connection group will translate that because each PVAD translates to a root within the package. So. Um, if you're doing PVAD, uh, if you're merging PVADs, I, I, from my practice, I haven't, I haven't done that. Uh, I usually stay away from that. That would be the equivalent of installing applications to the same SFT mount directory, which in in, in FE4.x, which might have been a little bit problematic. Um, so. Uh, there was another question uh, that I saw as well. Can connection groups be used in standalone mode with the app v5.1 client? Uh, connection groups can be used across the board. Connection groups are in integrated into the WMI interface within the app v client. So you, even if you have no backend infrastructure, you can manually create connection groups using the XML schema directly. Uh, I recommend people do this for testing. Uh, if they need to do testing on standalone VMs, especially standalone clients, and they need to quickly test connection groups, uh, you can do so with PowerShell. And of course, connection groups can be delivered through the uh, AppV5 uh, publishing infrastructure. They can also be delivered through Config Manager as well. However, if you are taking advantage of the, uh, of the new connection group schema with AppV5 uh, Service Pack 3, uh, you need to ensure that your at the management and publishing infrastructure is also at SP3 to support the new schema. And uh, of course, all of that carries over into at v 5.1. Okay, awesome. Let's, uh, in, in the uh, essence of time, let's 
keep moving. Uh, I'll ask you a few more questions as we go, and if we have time, uh, we'll give you the uh, question palooza at the end. All righty. Um, so in, in, in continuing quickly on connection groups, in, in at v 5 sp 3 we now support the following connection groups. The connection group known as Global Global, where we have a global package. Uh, that's kind of our master package, and we have global plugins. A good example of that is Outlook, especially if you have customers that have require, uh, requirement for compliance, external vault applications for email vaulting, and um, possible uh, unified communication and voicemail plugins to Outlook as well. Um, then we also have the global user combination where we have a globally published application. Office 2013 is a good example. And then we have a specific user targeted plugin like Hyperion's ESS base. Let's say you have several Excel users that need to actually have this particular plugin, but only a certain set of users, and this actual add in has been user targeted and not machine targeted. Uh, we now can have this mixed format connection group with App B5 SP3. And then finally, the user user. For example, if you're user targeting paint.net to a selection of users, and even further subset of users is actually going to have specific paint.net plugins, we can now combine, or we could have user targeted public, uh, published applications within a user targeted connection group. So if you are looking at these three here, the biggest change is the capability of having global and user within the same connection group. We now support mixed connection groups. Now, um, there are two options that were also introduced in at v 5 SP3 that uh, are treated as new features on top of the capability of having mixed connection groups. You now have the capability of having an optional package where the connection group does not have to to have all of the packages in order to function. Prior to SP3, connection group membership was considered mandatory, whereas the connection group would fail to deploy or the connection group would be ignored if uh, the user did not have all the appropriate packages, not only published but properly targeted as well, to where the targets were properly matched within the connection group. Also, we had, prior to SP3, reliance on a specific version per connection group per package. So every package had a specific version, and if you upgraded the package version, the whole connection group now had to be updated because the schema was tied to individual versions, not just individual packages. So now what we have is we have a use any version option which basically says a connection group can use any version of a package as long as that package is installed on that machine. You could take this to the next step to where you could have an optional version and, a, and, and, an, and the package being optional to give you even more flexibility. And again, all of this can be done in band with the App Fee Management and Publishing Group uh, our publishing system as well. So prior to SP3, connection groups were hard to design and manage. And even now, they can still be hard to design and manage. What you essentially have to do is you essentially have to architect your connection groups appropriately and determine what users need what specific software. And in most cases, you're going to run into a scenario where you're going to be able to, uh, you're, you're going to have master packages, like in the case of the example here, Office 2010 or Office 2013 or Office 2016. And in some cases, you're going to have mandatory specific add-ins like Outlook and let's say you have security mail options. And then at the same time, you'll have additional add-ins that are targeted to individual users and are not necessarily mandated as part of the connection group. So this is great, Steve. So um, can we can we show our audience kind of how these work? Um, are are you able to do a live demo? 
so yeah, let's let's um, how much time we got? All right, so let's let's look real quick at the uh, differences. and the connection group schemas. So here was the old connection group schema here, where you, it was pretty simple. You had, in the case of uh, this particular connection group running paint.net, we have um, the connection group contains the package IDs and the version IDs of every single member of the, pack, of, of the application package, or the act, every single member of the actual connection group. The problem, again, was the lack of flexibility. Every time we made a simple, the simplest of updates, we actually had to go in and disable the connection group, modify the connection group properties, and then, of course, uh, re-add the connection group and re-enable the connection group. And, of course, the, this could be simplified in, when you're using the management server. But at the same time, this was quite the overhead, and we were able to reduce this by changing the connection group schema to give us a new connection group format like we have here, where uh, we have every single package is optional except for the base package. The base package here, which I put at the bottom, and then, of course, the additional add-ins have flexible versions and are labeled with the is optional flag. In this case, all of these are optional. So even if there was only one or two of them targeted to the user, the connection group would still be able to be formed within the AMP catalog, thanks to the new flexibility. And in the case of the, I'm going to pull up PowerShell real quick, and we're going to pull up, pull up the get at the client package command. And as you can see here, I have several, I have actual several um, paint.net plugins available. And the master paint.net application. The master paint.net application is published globally, but the actual plugins, like this planetoid plugin, is actually published to the user. This align plugin is also published to the user. And this bolt bait pack is also published to the user. And they all function together within this. paint.net new connection group, which is very easy to add and enable. It just essentially takes two commands in PowerShell. Uh, it's great for standalone testing. Of course, if you're leveraging the AppV management publishing system, you don't ever have to worry about creating the XML manually because it's a management publishing system that will actually uh, take care of this for you. So let's move along a little bit because it's 33 past the hour. Okay. So um, additional sequencing changes in uh, SP3. We hid the PVAD during sequencing by default. The idea behind this was less steps, less confusion. However, we've discovered that there are many cases where you might need to bring this back. You can bring it back using a command line parameter. And you can actually bring this back uh, permanently by uh, enabling PVAD control in the registry as well. And as mentioned, run virtual is now no longer restricted to globally published packages. And by that, I mean the run virtual registry key. And uh, that just means the key can now be placed under H key current user as opposed to H key local machine. Now, what changed in 5.1? 5.1 is the most recent release of AppV 5.1. AppV 5.1 is the last release of, 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 of AppV that will be considered treated out of band from Windows. AppV is now being incorporated into Windows, and we'll talk about that towards the end of the session. But uh, we 
we brought about sequencer improvements, primarily in the workflow, scripting improvements, and finally, the most important thing for a lot of our users on 4.5 and 4.6 is conversion enhancements. Now, um, I should point out that due to the limits of time, we've been focusing the scope pretty much on applications and sequencing as opposed to the infrastructure. And uh, perhaps we might can have a deep dive later on on the infrastructure, but uh, I, I wanted to point out that these are not the only changes in 5.1. These are the changes in the world of sequencing and the actual application virtualization itself. So, um, First and foremost, in the sequencer, we made some changes to the virtual file system where we allowed for the importing and the exporting of the package manifest. Now, we know that a lot of our users were essentially um, kind of doing this behind the scenes, taking advantage of the temporary directory. Uh, but we now know that uh, this is a feature that can definitely be taken advantage of if people need to import uh, information from the manifest. And uh, for example, they might need to export and make changes manually to the manifest so they can import things back into it. Uh, we now allow you to import a directory of files directly into the VFS without having to essentially create a batch file that you actually run during monitoring. We can also allow you to update VFS files without deleting and re-adding as well due to this file export and import feature. Um, the virtual registry now allows us to um, import and, and export .reg files. We also have a find and replace dialog as well in the actual sequencer. And then finally, if you're using App V for the purpose of virtualizing web applications, especially Java-based applications or applications where you want to isolate the BHOs. Um, you can now disable and enable BHOs or browser helper objects, which are sometimes called ActiveX controls, but they're not necessarily ActiveX controls. They can also be handlers to JP launchers as well for Java. Uh, but all of these can be disabled or enabled if you are including web applications for Internet Explorer 11. Of course, we all know that in the new world of Microsoft Edge, we don't have BHOs anymore, and uh, we now treat BHOs as legacy solutions. We also made changes to the CAL, particularly CAL exclusions. Now, you may ask, what CAL. The CAL is the copy on write filter. It is part of the virtual file system that actually does the state separation of package state and user state from the immutable package cache itself, or what we call the actual app v package. Now, the biggest problem we had was there were a lot of applications that did not work where the particular Cal exclusion had an extension list that prevented uh, certain files from actually being copied and redirected over to the actual Cal locations. And we found that this was a big blocker to a lot of applications. So for 5.1, we removed the uh, extension or the, the, the we removed the majority of the extensions from the exclusion list, and we just essentially trimmed it down to just COM, DLL, EXE, and OCX files. Now, um, the VFSC driver change was made to prevent any file from being written that was open with the file execute access bit set, because frankly, um, we want to keep at V a, a secure product. And because the uh, VFS is now integrated directly with the native NTFS file system. Um, we, to, to remove these extensions would create a lot of vulnerability within the application and the, and the operating system. So those four are going to remain. And we found that we rarely run into situations where uh, the application is failing to work because of a uh, blocked COM, DLR, EXE, or OCX uh, cow. 
All right. So let me share back out my desktop. So I'm just going to step through the sequencer real quick. And of course, the sequencer has our wonderful little things called detectoids, which tell us, uh, again, along the lines of current recommended practices, um, things that should probably be disabled. In this case, I have antivirus, I have Windows Search, I have other applications running, particularly the application that is presenting this to you. And of course, antivirus software, additional antivirus software is running. So this would be something you would actually want to resolve and then refresh to verify that we don't have this issue anymore. And then, of course, we have our three methodologies of, of packaging or sequencing. We have our standard application, our add-in or plug-in, or our middleware. Under the hood, you'll go through the same stuff. This actually controls the workflow. And, and what I mean by workflow, there are certain things that you will want to be able to select and do when you're sequencing a standard application that you don't necessarily need to do when you're actually virtualizing middleware. And I'm just going to do a quick installation, and this installation is going to be Trillion. Now, if you notice, the uh, primary virtual application directory does not appear because I'm using a default sequencer configuration. You can actually do that using the uh, enable PVAD control registry key if you would like to bring the uh, primary virtual application directory back. Or you can, when during the installation, you can locate the fake PVAD that was actually generated behind the scenes and, in, and choose that as the installation directory. That's another way to do it. So I'm going to go to desktop. Now, if you're noticing here, I'm using a 64-bit sequencer, and I'm sequencing a 32-bit application. If you're deploying to a 64-bit client, um, I would definitely advise using a 64-bit sequencer. Uh, obviously, you'd have to use a 32-bit sequencer if, you're, if your sequencer is on a 32-bit operating system. And I'll cancel all that. don't want to do that just yet. Finished installing. And of course, the goal here is to simplify the process of sequencing. To maintain the workflow model, and you'll see here, detected Visual C++ runtimes as well. This was a feature that was introduced actually in Service Pack 2 to where if you virtualize an application and it detects that it requires runtimes, it will actually package those runtimes with the application behind the scenes so you don't run into the problem of deploying it to a machine that might not necessarily have those runtimes already deployed. And I'm going to go ahead and stop, and I'm going to invoke the advanced package editor, which is essentially the um, the tabbed sequencer where we are able to actually now go in and do fine tuning. And I just wanted to point out some of the additional features that we have within the sequencer. For example, here the enable browser helper objects. This was actually added in um, at the 5.1 that will allow you to, if it detects that you have browser helper objects, you can turn this on and off. The manifest file export and import option, of course, is available here as well. The manifest file is essentially the closest thing we would say is analogous to the OSD file that was in previous uh, versions of AppV prior to AppV5. Um, the manifest file is actually embedded into the AppV package. It can be overridden through dynamic configuration, through either deployment configuration or user configuration. However, that's kind of um, 
not 100% in terms of parity with all of the options that are available in the manifest. For example, if you wanted to adjust OS targeting, you would actually have to um, modify the manifest file as opposed to overriding with dynamic configuration. The uh, package files as well have much more features including the capability of adding entire directories. You also have the find and replace option that is available in the uh, virtual registry screen as well. So uh, there was a question by Andrew Gallucci. When do those VC runtimes install if needed, and does this impact publishing time? It can, of course, impact deployment as well. Um, there is an option to turn off the uh, Visual C++ or the Visual C um, detection feature in the sequencer under the uh, Tools option. Another welcome change in the world of v 5.1 is the support for multiple scripts in v 5.1. Script Runner is a new XE as part of the v client. And the nice thing about Script Runner is you can now pass multiple scripts to it, which um, gives you a lot more flexibility depending on uh, how you are incorporating script, scripting into your v 5 packaging. What are, we, we listened to a lot of our customer feedback, and a lot of customer feedback found that there were a lot of limitations in terms of uh, scripting flexibility. While we had many options for scripting in, in regards to package events, each event was limited to a specific element for scripting, and that caused us a, uh, that caused us a big problem. Um, and, and, and so 5.1 gave gives us now more flexibility, and I'll point out kind of the differences between how scripting can be incorporated uh, prior to 5.1. Now, you can still use legacy scripts, but Script Runner is now available for you as this multipurpose script executor, and of course, uh, that includes uh, you know, PowerShell scripts, VB scripts, batch files as well. So uh, the old format, you would have to actually uh, provide the path directly to the interpreter. So if you were running a batch file, you would actually have to specify command.exe. If you were running a PowerShell script, you would actually have to supply it. If you were running the, um, a, 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 a VB script, you would actually have to supply W script or C script as the actual path, and then the argument would be the script itself. So the new format gives you the capability of running script runner exe as a path, and then the arguments could be anything from an executable to a VB, a VB script, a batch file, a PowerShell script, and you can call as many as you want on a particular uh, package event. By package event, you might also hear this referred to as a package trigger. It's important to point out that um, the security context for script runner in these scripts is going to vary on the type of package event. So there are certain things that you still want to be mindful of. For example, if you are um, mapping drives, you want to map drives under the context of the user that you're actually, that's actually uh, running the application. So you wouldn't want to include that in a script that's on the add package event because the add package is actually going to be running as system. And uh, script runner can also be, can easily be called uh, through deployment configure user config. One very popular use case for the manifest import and export feature is people actually want to embed scripting into the app feed package without having to rely on dynamic configuration. Um, be careful doing that because you're locking your package into scripts, but um, it, it, it can be done, and um, there are many people using it, and they're very happy that they can now do that with 5.1 pretty easily. And finally, 
I want to talk about, before we go into futures, I want to talk about conversion from 4.6. Now, uh, I will acknowledge that there have been a lot of issues since the release of App v5 with the success rate of package conversion. And um, even with all the warning it's, that we can give you in the world, um, even with acknowledgement that things like scripting would have to be repurposed, uh, our biggest complaint came from users who had packages from 4.6 which had a lot of hard-coded paths within configuration files. By hard-coded paths, these were paths going to what we call the SFT mount directory or mount drive, which was a, based off of a fake Q drive in AppV4.x. This Q drive um, issue was really kind of the, 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 the big hurdle that we needed to jump over because this was responsible for a majority of packages not converting successfully. So what wound up happening is we, instead of trying to engineer something that would actually go into these hard-coded path files and actually make changes within the files, that was such an insurmountable engineering feat, we decided to fix the issue on the client at runtime to where if we detected that there was queries to the Q drive, that uh, we would intercept those and redirect those to the PVAD root or the root of the actual package. And we found that this was a huge breakthrough in, ter in terms of actually successfully converting packages from 4.5 and 4.6 over to 5.1. Uh, so um, this also made me a winner in my own household because I had, uh, for the first time, been able to convert a package from 4. that I originally sequenced on Windows XP with at v4.5, and I had never been able to convert this package successfully from at v uh, from at v4.5 to at v5. in the past, but now with at v5.1, I was actually able to convert this package successfully, and um, just to kind of uh, show you the original package format. The original f package format was right here. This was an application that I had that I was actually uh, had actually sequenced for two, my two young daughters. Yes, I do use AppV at home. I'm kind of a nerd in that regard. And uh, I then converted the package successfully over to AppV5.1. But you know, the conversion while the conversion was successful, the ultimate test is can we actually launch the application? And an application that is, has not been modified since 2002 is now being launched via at V on Windows 10. Oh, look at the cute dogs and cats. Aren't they cute? <laughs> is it going to launch? Fingers crossed. And there it is. All is well. Now, um, if you want to look at this through Procmon, um, the problem with Procmon is the altitude of Procmon actually sits below the mechanism in the VFS that actually does this. Now, it would be wrong for me to tell you to adjust the altitude for Procmon um, because we don't recommend doing that, although we do have MVPs that actually have instructions on how to do this if you would actually like to demonstrate it, that. But uh, again, I would highly discourage that even though there's ways to do it. Uh, that makes sense. Amazon Studio works with at the, uh, as well as some of the other virtualization technologies. Uh, we saw in the survey at the beginning of our call that about half of our listeners um, weren't using AppV. Um, so uh, they're probably using other things uh, like VM FinApp or uh, Citrix ZenApp and, and other types of virtualization technologies. And one of the main benefits for using the Admin Studio Suite product um, in your virtualization strategy is that uh, we allow you to um, create multiple outputs from a single file. So we can do the conversion into AppV or ThinApp or um, ZenApp or um, you know, other virtualization technologies uh, all from a single tool. Um, 
we also provide you that one process with multiple outlets. Um, the ability to do batch automation and be able to convert um, you know, 100 or 150 apps at a time uh, within one process. Um, also an important piece of it is suitability testing, being able to determine up front whether an app is even capable or, or a good subject to be virtualized. Um, we also help you to centrally manage connection groups within Admin Studio. Uh, you talked a lot about connection, uh, connection groups. They're very important. They do tend to get uh, kind of out of control, um, but we allow you to, to centrally manage those, make it a little bit easier. And then we didn't talk a lot about distribution, but uh, we also, from the Admin Studio Suite product, can help distribute packages to AppV servers and System Center Configuration Manager as well. So uh, we are at about the top of the hour. I'd like to thank Stephen for uh, all the information. We did get quite a few questions, um, and what I will look to do is to um, get Stephen's answers on those, and we'll be posted, posting those to a blog post on the Application Readiness blog here in uh, the next few days. Uh, in addition, you can explore the website, uh, www.flexerasoftware.com. Uh, you can download a free trial of the Admin Studio Suite product. Uh, you'll see a big button on there. You can't miss it. Uh, and you can also contact a Flexera representative or a business partner to learn more uh, about what we can do. Uh, there will be a link to the recording sent out uh, in a follow-up that you should get in the next few days. Uh, and again, I would like to thank Stephen uh, very much for your participation and all your great uh, information on this webinar today. Thank you very much, and have a great day. It was a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, that does conclude the webinar for today. We thank you for your participation and ask that you please disconnect your line.